Hey, this is Molly. Before I introduce you to today's guest, I'm thrilled to tell you about an unbelievable event on May 5th that I am super excited to be a part of. Broadcast live from Atlanta to 100,000 people around the globe, LeaderCast Live is the largest one-day leadership event in the world. Join me and an incredible lineup, Tyler Perry, Andy Stanley, Daniel Pink, and Susie Welch, just to name a few. Again, it's on May 5th, and it's a day of leadership development. To learn more about how you and your team can attend or host a live simulcast, visit leadercast.com. Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest is the marketing visionary behind some pretty incredible brands, from Coca-Cola to Turner to the NBA's Atlanta Hawks. Wherever he goes, Atlanta Hawks CEO Steve Coonan brings with him excitement, innovation, and vision, and a whole lot of fun. Under Coonan's direction, the Hawks launched an innovative rebranding campaign and have enjoyed a renaissance of relevance in Atlanta and beyond. A longtime entertainment and marketing veteran, Coonan previously spent 14 years with Turner, where as the president, he was instrumental in the programming and media rights acquisition processes around the NBA and NCAA and helped build strong brand franchises inside the NBA and NBA on TNT. Prior to Turner, he spent a decade at the Coca-Cola Company, where he was named the Sports Executive of the Year by Sports Business Journal, while serving as the company's Vice President of Sports and Entertainment Marketing. Steve joins us today to talk about creating a culture of innovation, the creative process, finding the value in risk-taking, and the secrets to marketing he's learned through his decades of experience. Follow Steve on Twitter, at Steve Coonan. Thanks for joining us today, Steve. So Steve Coonan, it is so awesome to have you on. I got to tell you, I have admired you for years. And I think it was, I don't know, maybe six months ago or something, we spoke at an event together. And I reconnected with you a little bit there, which was really cool. Um, but so, you know, you've brought so much excitement back to the Hawks, the franchise, um, obviously here in Atlanta. You know, when you came on board, um, I would imagine you looked at a landscape of things you wanted to tweak or change or improve. What, where did you start in terms of making some of those changes, whether it was culturally, internally, externally? Tell me a little bit about how you started that process. Well, first of all, thank you, Molly, and thank you for having me on. It was great seeing you at the History Center. And we, so I, I wanted to do the Hawks um, after 14 years at Coke and 14 years at Turner. And, and my lens was about doing something for the community. I think sports teams, and I think we just witnessed this in Atlanta in both the positive and the negative, but right. I think sports teams can rise the tide of a city, connect total strangers, and so – kind of our mission going in was to excite and unite the city of Atlanta through Hawks basketball. And there's this old saying, how do you cook an elephant? And the answer is a piece at a time. Right. And so culturally the employees here had not had a great experience, hadn't had a kind of a North star to follow. And then for the fans, it, it was kind of, you know, an entertainment alternative and a, and a bit of a mess in the sense that the Hawks didn't stand for anything. It didn't have a brand. It didn't have, you know, a real story behind it. So we we worked on two paths. The first was to create a story, and part of a story is knowing who you're telling the story to. Sure. And who are you targeting? So we did a lot of research, and when we found, and I knew a lot of this from Turner by looking at TV ratings, Atlanta is a phenomenal NBA town. It's always one of the top five for any national broadcast. The problem is, is that Hawks aren't the de facto answer for your favorite NBA team. Right. If you ask somebody in Boston, who's your favorite team? It's the Celtics. There's no gray. And when we did a market audit and a research audit, we asked people who your favorite team was, and 83% of Atlantans had a different answer than the Hawks. Mm -hmm. So. Kobe, wow. 
Lakers, LeBron. So that that screamed brand apathy. And so job one was to fix the brand story, to change the narrative, to make the Hawks very appealing to what we call next generation Atlantans. Not a lot of people are from here. I am one of the few native Atlantans, and I guess we don't breed real well in captivity because there's not many of us. <laughs> but there's a lot of kids who are born here, 2.1 million 18 to 44 is in our town, so a young city. And younger people and diverse audiences rarely get marketed to by sports teams. Because sports want to sell sponsorships and sports want to sell tickets, they're always looking for the affluent corporate executive and usually the middle-aged white male. And so we built our story, our social voice, our brand voice, in talking to younger and talking to diverse and talking a very different narrative than has been done in sports. And knock a little bit of metaphorical wood, it seems to be working rather well. (laughs) But your background, I'm sure, uh, served you really well as you embarked on this. Yes, I I think um, I think sports are a part of a marketing. They're an idea. There's an affiliation and a fandom and kind of understanding the consumer mind when you're selling them a brand, a product, a TV show. Um, I I do think was helpful, and I think where it really is more helpful than anything is in risk-taking. When you do TV shows, nine out of ten are going to fail. So you learn a little bit about risk-taking. And I don't think think the Hawks in the past had taken many, you know, marketing risks. I think they followed a very traditional playbook, which doesn't work, you know – in essence, they were analog in a very digital world. Right, right. And we are incredibly digital. We, you know, one of my favorite stories is we released our schedule for this year. Everybody does it on a calendar grid. We released ours all in emojis. I, and so, you know, the day we did that event together, that was when that came out. And it was the whole yep. rage. It was awesome. Yeah, I mean, we had literally had tens of millions of people looking at Atlanta Hawks' schedule That's and so trying cool. to figure out who were the scissors. They were the Clippers, not the scissors. You know, what was that spider web? It was the Nets. And it was engagement, and it was different, and, and it was fun. And from a marketing standpoint, it didn't cost us a penny. Right. And exactly. culturally, the thing that I was the proudest why – you know, the CEO of a team is similar to the quarterback in the NFL. You get too much credit and too much blame. I was a 25-year-old in our digital marketing department that we had built a culture that they could go do that without asking my permission, without right. getting a committee together. Right. They proffered their own idea. They put it out. It was a huge hit, and they got rewarded for that. Well, I think I remember that, that, that somebody told you that that day, and you didn't know yeah. about it. And, which I is, did not even know about it, yep. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, um, a wonderful leader, and she was talking about how it's, it's, as leaders it's, it's important to assign responsibilities, not tasks. And it sounds cool. It sounds like you obviously have created an environment where people have responsibilities, not not tasks. And that's yeah. I, I think they do. And I also want to build a culture where failing with aggressive ideas, trying new things, is rewarded. You know, it's mistakes of stupidity that need to not be repeated, and they need to have consequences. But if you're trying something new and it doesn't work, that's great. What did we learn? How do we, you know, how do we make it better? What, what can we all do the next time? Sure. But, um, sure. and that's, we want to fail forward. And we obviously don't want to fail too often, but we do definitely want to fail forward. Sure, sure. What, you know, what do you think the biggest mistake is that, that leaders make when they come into a new organization? And, and on the inverse of that, right, what do you think are some of the most important things that leaders should do as they come into organizations or teams? Uh, you know, it was interesting. It depends on what the job is. If you're coming into – every time I've kind of taken a new assignment, um, it's been fairly radical change. And I think one of the mistakes that I've made in the past is damning the past, 
you know, most of the people who you're going to work with were there during the past. And if you make it sound that everything in the, you know, that happened was bad and everything that's going to happen under you is good, you're going to disenfranchise a lot of people. Mm -hmm. and, and I've made that mistake before. I have not paid the right homage to the past because I was so interested in getting to the future. And so I think you have to balance the positives and building on the past in change and rather than everything that happened before didn't happen and it's um it's only good when it comes forward and so something like the hawks where it's a palpable change it's a physical change i think absolutely has to um be acknowledged how the successes and then build on that right right well, and they say, too, that young people today are sort of adverse to failure um, because we've we've raised children today in a way that we kind of catch them before they fall. So what you're describing that you're doing, I think, is harder than ever today than it ever was before. I don't know if you find yeah, that to be true. Feedback. Well, it's very interesting. I actually still get parents trying to apply their jobs for kids at the Hawks. Unbelievable. And you know how you everybody has a pet peeve in life. <laughs> Mine is if the child can't connect with I, I have a philosophy and, and now it's a practice. Any kid who calls me or emails me and wants to talk about careers, I will give him my cell phone. I'll give him my home phone. I'll have a conversation. Any parent who does, I will not help that kid. Right. I don't care if it's Albert Einstein's grandson. I'm right. not doing it. Right. Um, <laughs> And I, I'm just shocked. And I had experiences at Turner. We had inside the NBA, Kenny Smith, Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley. And I actually have had parents call me thinking that their kids should be on that show because they did their <laughs> fraternities, you know, podcast. And it's stunning. Yep, I mean, I it's it stunning. And I love my kids and I want my kids to succeed. But failure is part of life. Right. And, Connecting with people's part of life. So. Right. <laughs> Amen. I don't oh want to sound God. like that angry Muppet in the you know theater balcony. But, right. Um, right. Well, you know what? I'm sure you've had some conversations with some parents that uh, or kids that probably won't make that mistake, mistake twice. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of stunning. I think that's going to literally be the book that I write about parents <laughs> of today's kids do you have you know at the hawks do you have a set of core values and you know what are they and, and what do they mean and how does it change the way you guys do what you do every day we so it's interesting we actually went with core actions the five b's cool. um and the five the five b's are, are something that everybody has on their desk it is something that is inherent, you know, and in, in be bold in the way that we approach our business, you know, believe and build our brand, build bridges through basketball, through the community, um, be present at every opportunity to convert somebody to be a Hawks fan and build an inclusive um, environment of diversity, inclusion and Southern hospitality. And so these five B's are kind of our internal mantra, and they iterate every year. They change a little bit. Um, you know, one was built, the first year was build the brand. The second year is believe in the brand. The third year is, you know, trying to find a word to substitute for execute the brand every time possible. But, right, um, right. And so but like is, building bridges, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, no, go. Now, building bridges through basketball is we have a very unique community outreach now going on in Atlanta. We have pledged to build 25 courts in underserved communities, and these are state-of-the-art beautiful basketball courts. And then we use them as a town square in those communities to bring both services, whether it's health services or reading services or entertainment with or basketball skills services. And so we're going into communities that quite candidly are never going to buy a ticket, much less a season ticket package. But the messaging we're sending to these underserved communities where most corporations aren't going in is that we care, that everyone is important. And by going in there and building these beautiful courts, what we're finding is, and we, we haven't had a year's 
full data yet, but as of a few months ago, crime was down in the communities, truancy was down in the communities, and the pristine way the community has taken care of these courts is amazing. They actually wow. probably look better today than the day that we put it in because people take pride. And so we're building, we only can be famous for one thing, and that's basketball. Right. So how do we use basketball to build a better Atlanta? And we think that that's the way to do it. So we've said no to a lot of dinners and a lot of, you know, things that um, other, you know, there's nothing wrong with, but it's just not us. Right. Um, right. So when you built those core actions, right, I mean, sometimes you see, you know, the glass window and the big board room with all the executives in there framing these kinds of things up. How did you do it? I mean, I would imagine you approached it with your team, but tell me how you did that and and because we have people that lead organizations that that are listening to this and i'm sure either have core actions core values mission statements all those things um but maybe they want to tweak them or maybe maybe they want to do it differently in the future so i'd love to know how you did it well i i think we the first thing we was we had our vision we, we wanted to impact and build bridges through, through basketball with the communities. The number one way to do that is to enable play. We know that if kids play basketball, not only do they lead a healthy, healthier, more confident lifestyle, but there's an opportunity for us to have a positive impact on their life and be relevant and important into the community. And I think sports have to be very very, very careful between greed and getting every dollar and reinvesting back into the communities. You know, Tony Ressler, who's our principal owner, calls Atlanta, calls our team a community asset. He doesn't own it. The city does. He's wow. just the steward of it. Wow, and it starts there. And the amount of resources he's put in, the people he has brought and put on our foundation board, the independence that we have created – and we're we're constantly on the hunt for big ideas, audacious opportunities that we can find. You know, finding the funding is easier than coming up with the ideas that are actionable <laughs> at, at scale. Right. Um, the basketball courts are very actionable. We're working with. Met, you know, the city of Atlanta, we're working with College Park, we're working with um, county management in Fulton and DeKalb to find the places that need the help that also can help program it. Um, and like the Mayor's Center of Hopes in Atlanta. So I think the idea is I'm a huge, huge admirer of what McDonald's has done with Ronald McDonald House. Mm -hmm. Huge admirer. Sure. And, and I am for two edges of the sword. One, it is so consistent with their brand. It takes care of children and families in their worst possible moment. When your child is sick, it gives you an affordable place to stay located near a children's hospital in municipalities around the world. Right. That's the That's one awesome. side. The other thing, it allows McDonald's to say no. And in our city, and as phenomenal as Atlanta is, we have 17 Fortune 500 headquarters here. Um, including some of the biggest brands in the world. And unfortunately, I don't think I can't. And I don't think I'm not sure you could. And I'm not sure any consumer could say what their philanthropy is. What do they stand for? Mm -hmm. So the Atlanta Hawks in the NBA connote one thing, and that's basketball. And so it's our job to take that fact and then get as creative as possible around basketball so that's always a connection back to our brand akin to McDonald's with Ronald McDonald. Wow, Dodgers. that's awesome, Steve. I mean, that is just fantastic. And I'm sure there's ways that you can incorporate the athletes, right, the players. Oh, in absolutely. The work that you do, which is just awesome, of course. Um, you know, I look to you and I think about what you've done in your career and, and you know, I think about innovation. I mean, you've, you've – you've reinvented yourself in some regards in some of the biggest and, 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 and most respected brands in Atlanta. Um, and, and every time you do it unbelievably um, well and continue to do that and getting to know you better has just brought that to, to the forefront for me, which has been really, really cool. And, you know, innovation is a word I think people use all the time and, and, and we all want to be innovative, right? But 
and I think you're one of the best. How do you how do you cultivate it, right? And how do you encourage that I a, as a leader on your team? How do you create that innovative mindset that you have done everywhere you've gone? It seems. Well, I think the first thing is. And first of all, thank you very much, Molly. Um, your words mean a lot to me. I've, I've been a huge fan of yours as I've watched you shatter a few glass ceilings yourself. Um, so so I, I do appreciate it. You know, inherently, one of the things that I love about kids, and hopefully one day my kids will be parents and I'll have grandkids to, to play with, is that they don't lack – they have no fear. There's no inhibition. There's no – fear. And what I find is stifling to creativity is fear. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to say anything wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you build a culture where, where ideas are rewarded and where ideas are, there's no consequences. You know, we have a philosophy um, that ideas are like diapers when they're full of crap, you throw, just throw them away. <laughs> I love it. That's cool. And there doesn't have to be consequences for, a, you know, a bad idea. But even a great idea with bad execution is a bad idea. So you don't have to – not everybody has to be the creative source, but everybody's got to plus up and make things better. And then the execution needs to be – you know, as close to flawless as possible. But a lot of it's risk-taking. I mean, we we did the, um, again, what's our voice? Our voice is young and diverse. What are the connecting tools to that audience? Social media. One of the top social media brands is Tinder. So, our you know, we did Tinder night, swipe right night at the Atlanta Hawks, wow. where we had 400 young people buy tickets, they went to the Love Lounge. We had roses and Altoids and, you know, had a lot of fun with it. Actually, a couple met that night that's going on two years. Oh, my They've gosh. They've been together. Cool. And it, it, it created a huge amount of buzz and a huge amount of news. And so the next thing we did was we've sold it and partnered with Budweiser, and we'll be doing Let's Be Buds. Oh my and so gosh, we're taking an idea it. that we developed and then now we're using it and the ideas came from different places. You know, I, I put out the tender idea because it, it couldn't have gotten done unless it came from me because of fear. Right. And it sent, made a tone that you can take some risks. And then our marketing group named it Swipe Right Night, which was brilliant, much better than Tinder. And then our sales group just sold it as Let's Be Buds. So the same idea got more three times from national news to revenue to, you know, part of what differentiates us. Because when we look at our target consumer, you know, I grew up in a world with very little ambiguity. The Russians were bad. Americans were good. You know, there was all even the cartoons had some innocence and good always beats evil. Now you go to today's millennial audience they grew up where you're in a banking crisis, in a corporate confidence crisis, in a government crisis. Their cartoons are Family Guy, and their cartoons are, are South Park, which are, you know, submersive, cynical, pessimistic, with but always tinged with optimism. Sure. And there's a different BS detector that these kids had. We just kind of believed everything. <laughs> this generation starts believing nothing, and you've got to prove yourself to them. Sure. And that happens with your employees also. By doing Tinder Night, it sent a massive signal internally that things had changed. Right. Things are different. And then when it became the lead story on the Today Show and a few other places, it said, whoa, th this can work. We can be different. And so we've done a lot of, you know, I'll, I'll say very edgy things. And that's edgy for mainstream, and it's in the right voice for building your audience. Right, right. It, that is the coolest story. And how cool that now you've aligned it with a brand and – and you've got a couple that's been connected for two years. I mean, what fun yep. will it be if they could connect at the next level? And, and I said we'd pay for the wedding. That's awesome. I was going to say, I'm sure you probably are going to do something cool. That's great. Oh, we absolutely. Have, have them down center court at halftime. And, uh, you know, you got it. We will. We will commercialize their life. That's absolutely. cool. So how do you hire for innovation and creativity? Like as a leader, obviously, you need great, innovative 
creative people internally to support your vision and the brand shift that you've made? How do you do that? I, I think that's the hardest point because you never know if you're getting the, the person who came up with the great idea or the person who sat on the team or in the next cube of the person who came up with the great idea. Right. And I failed at this a lot. Um, I hire for chemistry and fit. Okay. You know, skills can be taught, um, and, but chemistry and ability and collaboration and communication, if you don't have those – it doesn't matter. You can be the most skilled person in the world. Right. But if you can't, if you can't fit into kind of a matrix tapestry organization where responsibilities overlap and you're only as good as the communication in your teammate, then you fail. And it's hard. And, and a lot of times it's the wrong structure. And it's one of the things that I'm constantly working on because we certainly don't do everything right. And when you move fast, your communication lags. And so it's finding the right interdependencies and then rewarding the behavior that you want. If you, um, if all you do is reward growth, growth comes at a cost. So by having multiple metrics that you reward, um, including collaboration and communications, then I think you come closer to getting what you really want. And but it's an area that we're constantly trying to improve because we certainly don't do it as well as I wish we did. Mm -hmm. Well, in the sports space too, I know moves so fast. Um, how how when you when you when you say you reward failure, right? You reward innovation. You reward creativity. Um, to, can you help with some of the other leaders that are listening? How do you how do you do that? What are some of the things that, that recognition? You do? Okay. You okay. know, there's two kinds of income: psychic income, which is a note, a praise, a gift. Um, an acknowledgement publicly or even privately. Right. We had a very big owners meeting yesterday about a complex issue. And normally we wouldn't go down and bring at the VP level to, to our board. Um, but he was a subject matter expert. We brought him in and quite candidly, he killed it. And before I went to sleep last night, it was, and he did, I thought it was really important. He got a note in front of his peers, bosses, et cetera, saying what a great job and how, pleased everybody was with you know the insight and knowledge that he brought to the table right and i think that sometimes has a better motivational effect than writing giving somebody a gift card you know mm -hmm. or more importantly not acknowledging it sure when you get to be a leader a ceo a president of an organization your feedback is not going to be from people above you it's going to be from people around you you know, and so you have to um, subjugate your ego and understand that you're treated differently. But if you don't treat your employees with a good feedback loop and with letting them know when things go well and that they have significant responsibility, you're going to um, – you're not going to have as motivated of teams. So I think it's really important to pay psychic income to your employees for great contributions. And I think it's important as a leader to understand that's not a benefit you get as being the person responsible for an organization, because a big part of the leader's job is dealing with problems. And a lot of times it's being the screen door that catches all the bugs, flies and eggs that are hurled <laughs> at your organization. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I, it's interesting what you're saying because I think you, you, you couldn't be, you know, I think as young people, being able to reward them with our words of encouragement and support can be obviously remarkably impactful, and, and you, you clearly do that so well. One of the companies that I have done some work with and admire is, you know, the Home Depot, and, and they have this whole philosophy about this inverse pyramid, right, where the CEO is actually at the bottom of the pyramid and, and everything rolls up all the way to the customer and it, you seem to have that kind of mindset, right? We're, we're sort of a servant mindset, whether it's to the community, the fans, to the, to your employees. And I, I know, I know that creates a remarkable culture. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and you have to live it every day. And you know, some days it's hard to do. It's real hard to do, sure. um, especially when you're catching a lot of bugs and eggs at that screen door. <laughs> right. But if you, but if you make it about the leader, and I've been in those organizations 
where it's you know the leader and the three hundred dwarfs, it's not going to work long term. Yeah, that's not. It's not sustainable. Yep, I agree. I agree. So one last question: Who would you say helped impact and shape your leadership philosophy? You know, I, I joined Coke in my twenties, and so very impressionable. Um, most of my peers had significant educational advantages, MBAs, PhDs at Coke. But what was, the company was bereft was is risk taking and ideas. And so I never, ever, ever called myself or thought of myself as um, being creative. I, I guess when I look back and I had my fraternity pledges put um, 30,000 crickets in our rival's frat house, <laughs> that might have been creative. It certainly was disruptive. I think before the word disruptive existed, if you have crickets everywhere making right. noise all night long. That's awesome. So I, what I found at Coke was the path uh, to success – wasn't, you know, necessarily intellectual and educational, but it was idea. And so I, when I got there, I learned that ideas were really valued. And working for a guy like Sergio Zeman, who brilliant but tough, and Doug Ivester, brilliant but crave creativity, and Jack Stahl, brilliant financial sense but needed a counterweight. Um, and then it, the same thing at Turner, where everybody was very creative, but there really was never any kind of focus on building a brand. You know, TV networks work on hits. We were the first ones that really sold the genre well, TNT for drama, TBS for comedy. And I think the brand was as important, if not more important than the programming, because advertisers knew what we stood for. And so did consumers. Sure. So it, it's, you know, I, I never had that single mentor, you know, that I can lay a wreath, you know, at, the, at their feet. But it was working with lots of different people, some who were incredibly difficult to work for. And you also learn how to manage adversity, which is really a lot of building a career. Most days don't go as well as our moms would want them to. <laughs> you know. And so you have to fight through that. Sure, sure. But, you know, it, it's funny what you're saying because I couldn't agree with you more as far as if we just stay curious every day, right? So for the young people that are listening, if we just stay curious, then everybody can be a mentor for us, right? I mean, you might be checking out at the grocery store and learn something from someone. You know, you could be at the you know library or at the Starbucks or, I mean, they're everywhere as long as we stay curious. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. And for me, it's all about reading. I mean, I still read seven to eight digital newspapers. I, my wife is so happy that print and ink is not on our walls and furniture anymore. <laughs> she literally used to go scrub every walkway in our house that I had touched and I'd ruin furniture because I'd read so many newspapers. And now you can, you know, Flipboard and Apple News, you can have so many clip services. So many ideas come from other ideas. Right. And so it's being able to, to read something and then try to relate it to what you do. And so many of the, you know, kind of dynamic ideas we have had, and I've been fortunate enough to have in my career, have been inspired by reading something and saying, well, what if we did this to this? Right. And so I think... I think reading opens up a whole a huge, huge world of possibilities. And I know that sounds crazy, but I think people are sometimes too busy to read. And I think if they read, they wouldn't be so, you know, they'd be more productive. Sure, sure. No, I know. I mean, I, <clears throat> I agree. I mean, I know people that try to read one to two books a week, right? Listen to one podcast a day. I mean, and they really create goals and metrics around it so that they can ensure that they do it. Because it's an easy thing when we're living in our lives to react to the incoming calls and emails and not do it. But it's a totally, Absolutely. it's a big part of personal growth for sure. So, yep. so Steve, I want to be respectful of your time. We always end these with a rapid fire kind of questions. And so fun. I know you're going to be good at this. This will be fun. So I'm going to fire off, I don't know, plus or minus about 10 questions. And if, if you just can fire off the, the thing that comes to mind when I ask it, is that cool? Is there any kind of rating on this podcast? No, 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 no. I mean, you, okay. for me, right. for you, you're a 10. You already nailed it. Oh, no, I was talking about like TVMA or I was talking about content answers. No, no, oh, no, thank no. Thank you. No, 
No. There's your okay. Turner all right. I'll keep it out. clean. I'll try to keep it clean. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't have Let's to keep go. it clean. We're all about transparency and authenticity, man. Do it. Say what you want to say. Okay. It's all good. Don't hold Got back. It. Okay. One word to describe yourself. Funny. One word others would use to describe you. Funny. <laughs> What's your biggest fear? Not being funny. <laughs> Favorite book. That was funny. What's your favorite book? Uh, um, this is not very rapid because I am absolutely stalling. Um, hit and run. Hit and run. What's your favorite social media channel? Twitter. What is a hidden talent that people would know about you? I... I know a lot about seashells. Really? Okay. What's the best advice you've ever received? Slow down and think through before you open your mouth. What's your greatest accomplishment? My family. Nice. What's your biggest pet peeve? Mothers and fathers who call me for <laughs> jobs for their children. I love it. And what is your life motto? Have fun. Right. And maybe be funny. I'm just thinking, you know. Try, and try to be funny. Try to be funny. Well, you're pretty darn good at it, man. I got to tell you. Well, I, I think laughing is really healthy. Sure. You know, sure. I, I think, and I think not taking oneself too seriously is even more healthy. Sure. Sure. You know, so, and that's advice I try to give myself. It's hard with your linear mind and your, in your actual mind to not take things personally, especially in sports sure. where, you know. You suck is probably my middle name, but um, it's um, if I look at Twitter. But you know what? I'm okay if people have a point of view. That means there's passion behind it. Well, I mean, it's like the screen door you said with the flies and the eggshells. I mean, I exactly. bet every night you go to bed, you just sort of rinse that off and start over again, right? That's exactly right. I love it. That's exactly right. Hey, Steve, thank you so much for taking a minute to do this. It's very kind of you. I enjoyed it immensely. I hope I see you soon. I know. I hope I see you soon, too. Thanks, as always, for listening. And if you missed an episode, you can listen to previous episodes on iTunes or on mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be a game changer.